I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. This monitor has 160Hz refresh rate and I have the game running at a solid 160 frames a second. You can see my frame rate in the top right, that little tiny green number at the top there. And what this means is that the monitor is outputting over twice as much visual information every second as a 60Hz monitor or this monitor running at 60Hz. This gives you two main advantages. One is that it improves the connected feel that describes the precision and the fluidity when you're interacting with the game world. This is also something where low input lag is helpful and this monitor does indeed have low input lag, very low input lag, actually very impressive. I measured 2.2 milliseconds on this one, so really good, nice low signal delay, that's not an issue on this one. And if you happen to have adaptive dimming active, then that doesn't slow things down in that respect either. That didn't significantly affect the input lag readings, so really good to see that. The other advantage of this high frame rate, high refresh rate combination is that it greatly decreases the perceived blur due to eye movement. This concept is explored in an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness and summarised in the written review. But basically, most of the perceived blur you see on a monitor is due to your own eye movement and it's tightly linked to the refresh rate of the monitor. In addition, you have to account for pixel responses. And as usual, I like to assess that using pursuit photographs with the test UFO motion test for ghosting and also subjectively, which is really what I do in this video. But let's just take a look at the pursuit photographs first of all. So here the monitor is running at 160 hertz. I would definitely recommend checking out the responsiveness section of the written review if you want more context and also additional examples at lower refresh rates and also some comparisons with a few other models, the Gigabyte M32U and the Asus PG32UQX. They're just not included in this comparison because they don't run at 160 hertz, but there are comparisons with 144 hertz and lower refresh rates using those models. But basically this monitor is a good performer overall, it's a fast IPS model. Even if you have the overdrive set to off, it's by no means terrible in terms of its pixel responses. You just get a little bit of light powdery trailing, as I like to call it, behind the UFOs. But it's not an extreme weakness by any means. It's actually quite similar to the Gigabyte M32U using its optimal pixel overdrive setting. And that's a monitor which many people are very happy with indeed in terms of its pixel responses. And remember this is just using the off setting with the Acer. And if you compare with the ASUS PG32UQX, well that monitor certainly lags behind when it comes to pixel responses. And it has significantly more powdery trailing and some of it looks a little bit smeary in places for some transitions and that isn't an issue on this Acer, even if you're using the off overdrive setting. Moving on to normal, that removes some of the powdery trailing. There's just a little bit remaining. It really does stick close to the object though and it's mainly for the dark background, which is the top row, and a bit elsewhere for transitions not shown in this particular test, but nothing extreme by any means. There is some overshoot using this setting. You can see that inverse ghosting behind the UFOs. It's actually a bit clearer for some transitions which aren't shown in this test, and I'll try and show you them with the video very shortly, but I'd say it's moderate overshoot. Using the extreme setting on the other hand, that gives you colourful bright halo trailing with an inky look, which is much more noticeable to the eye. So in practice, either the off setting or the normal will be preferred depending on your tolerance to overshoot. I'm using normal at the moment and I do see some overshoot in places. So behind the edge of the wall there to the left of this wall, I can see some. I'm not sure if that'll come across on the video. It's not extreme overshoot by any means, like I said. Not super eye catching. There are some transitions which show it a bit more clearly, not in this particular scene. I might see if I can show you some a little bit later on. You can see it towards the left of the pillar there as well. But certainly at these high refresh rates, this isn't strong overshoot. And in terms of the weaknesses which remain, again, just a little bit of light powdery trailing in places. It's mainly where very bright shades are involved in the transition. And there are some bright shades involved in transitions here. You've got light sand. If I had the hood on, you'd be able to see some little white markers and that kind of thing. And that can give some of this powdery trailing, but it's not something you can assess with the video. It just adds a little bit of perceived blur because, you know, this isn't an OLED. You can see this kind of weakness if you look at the central area of the UFOs, the little white dots, they're blended together because of this as well. I'm on another scene on Battlefield 5. This one has a lot of darker shades involved in the transition, so it shows a greater variety of pixel transitions more clearly. And these are ones where IPS models do tend to struggle and VA models really tend to struggle with. And for that matter, TN models, although they're quite rare, they can have some standout weaknesses here as well, actually. But overall, the monitor does well. 
It's clearly a fast IPS model, good performance. Minor weaknesses in terms of very slight powdery trailing, just adds a little bit of extra perceived blur on top of what you'd ideally see, but nothing too dramatic. Remember I'm using the normal settings still, so there is overshoot, and there's some clearer examples of that in this scene than the previous scene. You might be able to see this sort of blue fringe to the flag there, that's overshoot. Bit of bright halo trailing around the tree as well. There's also a bit of dirty trailing which is darker than the background around the street lamp there. See if I can show it a bit more clearly with the sky in the background. You can see that kind of bit of a dark trailing around the light there. Not super eye-catching by any means, none of this is extreme overshoot. And again some bright halo trailing around the makeshift roof there. If you do find this annoying then just turn the overdrive off. That will shut off additional overdrive. It doesn't mean there's no overdrive going on. It seems that this panel is actually quite fast and it has some internal overdrive. So if you just want to use that without the additional overdrive, then use the offsetting. And again, the weaknesses aren't dramatic. There is more powdery trailing. It does add a bit of extra perceived blur, but it's not extreme. As I said, it's quite similar to the Gigabyte M32U, really, using its optimal setting. A little bit more of that, really, actually, than the Gigabyte. Some transitions are a little bit slower. But overall, not a dramatic difference. This is not sort of VA level smearing, and there aren't the kind of weaknesses you see on the ASUS PG32UQX or the ViewSonic alternative, the XG321UG, either. So many people will be perfectly happy with the response performance with this set off, and if they happen to be annoyed by the overshoot, that's definitely worth checking out. Back to my preferred normal setting now, and I'd like to talk about VRR, variable refresh rate. This monitor supports HDMI 2.1 VRR, also supports adaptive sync, so you get the full array, you can use VRR with the PS5, the Xbox Series X, PC, with an AMD and NVIDIA GPU, whether you're using HDMI or DisplayPort. The claimed variable refresh rate range of this monitor is 48 to 160 hertz, although in practice it seems to be more like 55 hertz to 160 hertz. This doesn't make a massive difference in practice. Just the thing to be aware of is that LFC, low frame rate compensation, is used and when you pass that boundary in either direction, so let's say around 55 hertz, you go below that, or 55 frames a second in your game, you go below that, then it triggers LFC. And there's a subtle momentary stuttering when this activates or deactivates. Not everyone actually notices that, it's pretty subtle. It's not like the kind of stuttering you get from frame and refresh rate mismatches. And this is eliminated whether the monitor is using LFC or whether it's in its main variable refresh rate hardware operation range, so above 55 hertz, it does get rid of tearing and stuttering from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches very nicely. And there aren't any particular issues which I note with some models like VRR flickering, that's, you don't typically see that outside of OLED or VA models, so still, you know, it's, it's nice to, to note that that isn't an issue. You can also use HDR at the same time as VRR if you wish, it's not a problem. And that's on both the AMD and the NVIDIA side. I've now got the game running at 120 frames a second. The monitor is running at 120 hertz. This does intensify the overshoot. It's not like it suddenly appears in an intense way when you hit 120 hertz. It's just that it does get stronger and stronger as you go below 160 hertz. So it is more eye-catching now. You might be able to see it on the video. I don't know how it'll appear on the video, to be honest, but I can see some pretty bright halo trailing. In this scene in particular, it's actually quite bad for the overshoot. Most scenes are a bit better than this, so the overshoot's a bit less noticeable. But again, you can of course use that off setting if it bothers you. I'm just going to switch over to that now. So yes, a bit more powdery trailing in places, but the pixel response requirements for a solid performance here are actually decreased compared to 160 hertz. So these weaknesses are actually less apparent when you compare the two models, not that they're extreme. Anyway, just worth noting really that at 120 hertz, the offsetting is actually pretty good. And I'm pleased to see that you can actually adjust the overdrive now. This was added with one of the firmware updates. You weren't originally able to do that. For some reason, they locked out the overdrive setting if you have FreeSync Premium Pro enabled in the monitor, which enables adaptive sync. So you could get around that by using HDMI 2.1 VRR, which doesn't require adaptive sync. But if you've got an AMD GPU, that isn't an option. And if you're using DisplayPort as an NVIDIA user, it's not an option. So that was really nice to see them add this support because I do think the offsetting is going to be something which people might like to use, particularly if you're sensitive to overshoot and you're frequently dipping well below the maximum refresh rate supported by the monitor. 
Speaking of which, I am now running the game at 80 frames a second, 80 hertz. I'm using the offsetting still. Actually works really nicely here. No particular overshoot to speak of. The powdery trailing is really minimal, to be honest. It's uh, just a little bit. Pixel response requirements slackened off further with this reduction in refresh rate. So it does really very well with the offsetting even. The normal setting then, that gives really quite strong overshoot by this point. Some bright eye-catching flashes, even if you're not really looking out for it, it just, I find it catches the eye when you're just playing a game normally even. Some people might not find that. It's not the strongest overshoot I've seen and it's not as strong as if I switch over to the extreme setting. I'll just do that briefly just for fun. So yeah, it's not like this. This is absolutely horrific and extremely distracting. So yeah, the normal setting is nothing quite like this. I'm now at 60 frames a second and I'm using the normal setting. 60 here at 60 frames a second and yeah, the overshoot is really quite strong, quite obnoxious now, using the normal setting. Set to off, much nicer experience. No perceived overshoot and it still does well in terms of its pixel responses. So again, I would just stress that for some people, the offsetting is going to be really the one to use. I would recommend trying out normal, seeing if you find the overshoot bothersome, particularly if you're able to sustain good high frame rates. And I know it's not nice to have to switch to different response time settings depending on the game or depending on the scene of the game all the time. Try both settings and see which you prefer. This one doesn't include a BFI black frame insertion or strobe backlight setting. That isn't an option on this one. So you just got this normal sample and hold experience here. But really this is quite a strong IPS performer in terms of its pixel responses and indeed its input lag. So when it comes to responsiveness, I'd really say it's the best monitor I've tested with an FALD backlight solution actually. And the backlight solution itself, if you're using adaptive dimming, is also very reactive. Generally I would tend to use that kind of thing, not for competitive gaming, but for more casual gaming or just slightly competitive gaming. Some people might still like to use it. I do feel this monitor is quite diverse with a sort of range of gamers which it can satisfy.